Yeah, our next speaker is Redford Neal from the University of Toronto, uh, talking about PQR. Uh, so. Okay, so uh, in this talk I'm going to uh, talk about uh, language extensions uh, that have been recently added in PQR and uh, some that I think uh, would be a good idea to add in future. Uh, of course, I'd like to uh, try to convince uh, other implementers that it would be good to add these extensions to uh, their R implementations as well. So, uh, first of all, some sort of philosophy of uh, what language features should be like. First of all, uh, I think it's important that the way the language uh, is set up leads to reliable programs. And that means that we want the simple, uh, obvious way to do something to also produce the correct answer. Um, so this is a, an area where R has some design flaws. Uh, so for instance, if you attempt to get a submatrix A from a matrix M by taking the columns from uh, uh, all the columns and the rows from row I to row J, uh, the simple, easy, obvious uh, way to do it is like this. But unfortunately, that doesn't always work. Um, it doesn't work if there happens to be only one column in M, and it doesn't work if, um, if uh, I is equal to J, and it doesn't work if uh, J is less than I, so you actually want to get zero rows. Uh, so to get this to work, what you actually need to write is what I've written down here. Uh, uh, if anyone knows of a simpler way, uh, let me know. But I think this is uh, basically what you need to do if you're just using uh, uh, standard base R facilities. Uh, but as you imagine, uh, not many people are going to write this. They're going to write this instead. And then their programs don't quite work, right? And so this is undesirable. Uh, another uh, thing one should aim for is for uh, uh, the obvious way of doing things to also be efficient as well as producing the right answer. And it's, it's not good to try to say, well, uh, this is inefficient, but we'll add this special funny trick that the experts know of, and then you can get it to go faster if you know that trick. Uh, so amongst the uh, things like that are things like seek.int and rep.int and dot row sums and NENA and writing Ls after your integers. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure this actually makes things go faster anymore, but uh, at one point at least uh, somebody thought it did. And uh, finally, uh, it's nice if the code is, is clear, concise, and, and beautiful. Um, beauty is uh, a bit of a subjective thing, but I think one can uh, see some things are ugly, and it'd be nice if one could get rid of ugly things, even if, uh, even if they sort of work and don't have any other flaws, but if they're ugly, that's not good. So, here are some uh, language extensions uh, that uh, I've been putting in, uh, in PQR. Uh, one set implemented recently is a set of related changes, which uh, um, are good individually, but which are also in, in total more than the sum of their parts. And they uh, are intended to address the design flaws surrounding the colon operator and the way the dimensions get dropped uh, with uh, matrix subsetting. And there's also some new forms for the for statement, which are more sort of a nice convenience. Uh, they don't aren't as crucial as, as this set here, which I think do address a, a, uh, a significant problem with the R language that leads to buggy programs and such. Uh, so some planned ways, uh, planned extensions in PR, PQR are some uh, ways of writing shorter, cleaner, less ugly code. And a, another, a, a general sort of syntactic mechanism uh, for adding flags to arguments. And then this syntactic mechanism allows one to do various different uh, uh, facilities which are, which are not particularly related as far as their semantics goes. They're related by the syntax of adding flags. And uh, then uh, in more in the lines of possible schemes are schemes for quoted arguments and passing things by reference that relates to uh, uh, the talk that will come after mine. And uh, I'd like to add automatic differentiation uh, and also automatic incremental computation, although the second of them I'm not so sure how to do. First of all, though, uh, the uh, uh, changes that were uh, uh, recently added to PQR and uh, which are intended to d address these design flaws in R. So the first is that we need a sequence operator that actually does the right thing. Uh, so using I colon J to where you intend to create an increasing sequence doesn't correctly produce a zero length sequence when J is less than I. Uh, instead, of course, it will uh, produce a decreasing sequence. 
Um, so this is this is annoying. Uh, if you know if you're aware of the problem, it's annoying because you have to put in all sorts of extra if statements or some other stuff in your code to get it to work correctly. And uh, if you're not aware of the problem or you're lazy, it leads to a buggy code in which uh, it sort of mostly works, but doesn't work in uh, edge cases where there happens to be no items, uh, no data items with value one today, or there, there has been usually. So your code has usually been working, but today you don't happen to have any of those, and so you have you need a zero length sequence today, and well, it doesn't work. Uh, so a second problem with the colon operator is that one colon n minus one doesn't start at one, um, because of course the one colon n has higher precedence than the minus, so this is actually goes from zero to n minus one. And uh, well, this just seems to be a poor precedence decision. It's uh, I, I'm, I suppose there's times when this is actually what you want, but uh, I think experience has shown that much more often you want the precedence to be the other way around. So uh, the solution is to have a new operator which produces only increasing sequences. If you happen to want a decreasing sequence, uh, well, you could use the old colon operator or you can just use rev. You can say rev one dot dot uh, as one up to n uh, and get it to go the other direction. And uh, because it only produces increasing sequences, it can produce zero length ones if the upper limit is less than the lower limit. And while introducing a new operator, we can also uh, choose its precedence more, uh, more carefully uh, uh, as well without, uh, without any uh, backwards compatibility problems. Of course, I'm assuming that we can't change any of these, we can't solve any of these problems by redefining what the colon operator does because there's too much code that depends on on the current behavior of the colon operator, so you have to have a new operator instead. So uh, in PQR, there's now a dot dot operator. Uh, I thought a long time about what to call the operator, and uh, as far as I can tell, uh, dot dot is the best choice. Uh, uh, here are some examples of its use, uh, just to get you a, to, to show you what it looks like. You can say for i in one dot dot n minus one, and this actually starts at one because the precedence of dot dot uh, is lower than the uh, than the uh, arithmetic operators. And uh, here we use uh, i dot dot i plus one in, as a as a uh, array index here. Uh, here's some more uses of it, and here's a little uh, a little uh, more peculiar use here. Uh, uh, if any v in uh, one dot dot j, and here you can see. Um, um, no choice of precedence is perfect. Uh, I had to parenthesize this because otherwise it wouldn't have the right precedence with, uh, with in. Now at this point you of course no, uh, uh, notice that i dot dot j is actually a valid symbol. Uh, so uh, how can this work? Uh, well it can't work unless you disallow symbols with consecutive dots in the middle of course. Um, I allow consecutive dots at the beginning of a symbol or at the end of a symbol. Uh, but consecutive dots in the middle are now disallowed. Uh, without that, you'd have to always put spaces around the dot dot, which would start to get error prone and, uh, and verbose and so forth. Uh, there are some ambiguities. Uh, of course, this is nothing new in R, as everyone who's written uh, uh, i less than minus uh, one uh, without putting some spaces in the right place will realize. Uh, uh, but the ambiguities are basically two. Something like i dot dot j plus one in friends is actually a call of a function called i dot dot. And uh, i dot dot minus j subtracts j from the variable i dot dot. Those are, I think, basically the only ambiguous situations. Um, of course, you can put spaces around the dot dot, and then it's not ambiguous, it will be a dot dot operator. The parentheses here are actually unnecessary also uh, because of the precedence, but of course you might have written them. Um, there would be no ambiguities at all if one also disallowed dot dot at the end of an, of an uh, identifier. Um, then uh, these wouldn't be ambiguous if dot dot isn't allowed at the end of an identifier, but unfortunately uh, um, dot dots at the end do get used, in particular in ggplot2 people do things like dot dot count dot dot. Uh, which is unfortunate from this point of view. So, uh, as far as compatibility issues from doing this, of course it's possible somebody uses dot dot in the middle of an identifier. Um, 
I think that's pretty rare, uh, but to accommodate old code, uh, there is an option for just suppressing parsing of the dot dot operator, in which case that code parses as before. Uh, another incompatibility or uh, need for change that's, that could break something is that the make.names function converts strings into names and converts characters that are not legal as part of a our name into dots, which can produce more than one dot in a row in the middle, and so those have to be collapsed to a single dot, which of course changes the result with possible compatibility issues. And similarly, make.unique uh, which uh, converts names to unique forms when there's duplicates, uh, adds a dot as a separator from a number that it appends. And that would produce two dots in a row if the, if the thing already ended in a dot. And so I just don't add a dot if there was one there already, which of course also changes the output. So conceivably there's some incompatibility with that. So that uh, that's just addresses the problem of Uh, well, you don't want to use a defined operator for this uh, for two reasons. One is it would have to be something like percent colon percent, and that's just too ugly. Um, dot dot is very good from that point of view. Uh, at least I think it looks fine. Visually, it looks fine. And it's very easy to type. It's probably even easy, even though it's two characters, it may be easier to type than colon. Whereas if it's percent colon percent, it looks ugly. It's hard to type. You can easily imagine that even if you add this nifty new operator, lots of people still do colon because it's easier. Uh, but I don't think that would be a problem with dot dot. I think dot dot is really easy to type. It's really, you can, it looks good as visually, uh, whereas percent colon percent wouldn't. Uh, so uh, I don't think you want to do it as a user defined operator. Um, maybe you're asking whether one could enlarge the scope for user-defined operators to include things that don't have percent signs around them. Um, I haven't thought of that. Um, that might be interesting, but I'm not sure it's necessary. Like, obviously, if you're, if you're adding this into the interpreter, you can add it into the parser too, right? So uh, it might be a, good, a nice idea in general, but I think it doesn't relate to whether one adds this new sequence operator. Well, do, tilde tilde is, is allowed at the moment, right? Uh, I think you can write two tildes in a row and get a funny formula with a tilde in the, uh, um, um, And yeah, I don't know. Uh, if one could consider that breaking that possibility would be OK, it wouldn't be too bad, although it, it has no, like dot dot also semantically relates to things outside R, like people do dot dot all the time outside R to indicate sort of this to that. It was the subrange operator in Pascal, for instance, so, um, whereas tilde tilde would mean nothing to somebody who didn't already know what it meant. Okay, so the dot dot operator so far just addresses the, the issue of getting zero length sequences rather than something that's reversed. Um, Another problem is the inadvertent dimension dropping, where, uh, for instance, you write, uh, you want to create a subarray of A with all its columns, but only the rows whose indexes are in the vector V. And so we write A sub V comma uh, to get all the columns and uh, only the rows with the indexes in V. Um, and this usually works, um, perhaps often enough that you don't detect the problem in your testing, uh, but then we actually get a vector rather than matrix if either V has length one or A has only one column. Uh, so because of that, there's lots of buggy code. People write this and it seems to work. Uh, and then one day there happens to be only one observation uh, in this data set and then it doesn't work any on that case, right? Uh, now if you, if you add drop equals false, then it will work. Uh, but uh, this means that rather than writing this, you have to write with a comma drop equals false, and you do that all over your program, and it now looks pretty bad, and well, maybe you don't bother. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, you either get uh, tedious and unreadable code, or you get buggy code. Uh, so we'd like to solve that. So uh, 
the start of a solution here is, first of all, PQR defines underscore to be a special object that is equivalent to a missing argument. And uh, underscore is not a legal identifier uh, at the moment, so this doesn't break anything from the fact that there is now a meaning to underscore. And uh, it's generally equivalent to a missing argument, but furthermore, when used as an array subscript, it selects all of that dimension without ever dropping it, even if that dimension happens to have length one. So once again, I, I think we can't just change this to never, never drop the uh, dimension for columns here, even if there's only one column, because there may be too much code out there that relies on that somehow or other. But if we uh, write an underscore rather than nothing here to indicate uh, that we want all of all the columns, then we can define that that new construct is not dropping that dimension. And uh, furthermore, I think it's clear that these sort of like non-existent arguments, uh, I think it's clear to write an underscore and explicitly say that that's, you really meant that to be missing, it wasn't a typo. Uh, so that's one aspect that, that avoids this getting dropped down to a vector rather than matrix if there happens to be only one column in the, in the matrix. Uh, for the second issue of it dropping down to a matrix to a vector if V happens to have only one element, um, PQR doesn't drop a dimension if the index is a 1D numeric array, even if it has length 1. So uh, there's a difference uh, in, in R between a vector with no dim attribute and a vector with a dim, dim attribute of length 1, which says it's, it's a vector, right, not a matrix. Uh, these actually print identically in these deep, with the default print procedure, but internally they're different. You can, if you ask what the div, if you actually explicitly ask for the dimensions of one, you'll see it, whereas the other you'll get null. Uh, so the, there's already a distinction there, but at present I think almost nobody pays much attention to this distinction. So, uh, and in particular, vectors very seldom actually have a given attribute, uh, saying that they're just vectors rather than matrices. So I think there isn't too much compat compatibility issue with changing exactly what happens if they do have a dim attribute. So we can say that if they have a dim attribute, then we never drop that dimension. So now if we write a sub array v comma underscore, the underscore means it's never going to drop the, drop the uh, dimensions because there happens to be only one column. And the fact that we write array v, that creates a vector with the dim attribute attached, saying it's a one-dimensional vector which looks very much like V, except it actually does have a dim attribute now, and uh, the subscripting can now say, well, because it has a dim attribute, we're not gonna drop this dimension even if it happens to be uh, length one. And I think there's not too much compatibility issue with that, because I think it's uncommon at present for, for vectors to actually have dim attributes, uh, although it's possible for them. Uh, so it's possible somebody has vectors with dim attributes and is relying on dropping of dimensions when they index with them, but I think that's probably not a, doesn't happen very often. So now uh, we can uh, get some synergy here. Uh, the solution to the, uh, to the reversing sequence problem was to introduce the new sequence operator. And uh, the start of the solution to the dimension dropping problem was to make a, uh, dimension dropping not happen if you have a dim attribute on your vector index. And so now we can make it so the new sequence act, a, operator actually attaches the dim attribute. And that means we can write a sub one dot dot n comma underscore. And we always get the right answer, even if there's only one column, even if n is equal to one, and even if n is equal to zero, in which case we get a matrix with zero rows, which is perfectly possible in R, and is what you want at times. Uh, so similarly, if we have a three-dimensional array, a three, we can write a3 and subscript with 1.n, dot, dot 1, and 1.m, dot, dot and we'll always get a 2D matrix out. Uh, even if n is equal to 1, or m is equal to 1, or they're equal to 0, uh, we always uh, uh, get what we want, I assume, which is a two-dimensional matrix, which is, I think, what you expect to get out of this. Uh, and uh, this is sort of the only way you could get it. If you had a drop equals false, then you'd get a, always get a three-dimensional array. Uh, because whereas if we do this, it will drop the middle dimension, which is just a scalar with no dim attribute, so it will drop that one. So uh, 
Now we get to one aspect of the problem that I haven't actually uh, put a solution to in PQR. And uh, this is that there's this unfortunate impossibility here uh, that zero length vectors can't contain negative elements. Uh, if you think about it, that's true. Uh, so if uh, the, normally if ix is a vector of positive integers, v sub minus ix is supposed to give us the vector with all the elements of v except those in ix. Except it doesn't work when ix has length zero. It does the opposite. If ix has length zero, that means we want to omit nothing, but actually we omit everything. Uh, not good. Uh, so a possible solution, not implemented yet, is to define a function except and, uh, and a vector that returns the vector with some suitable attribute attached to it, like dot uppercase except or something or other, and uh, that then gets recognized by the subscript uh, code as meaning that it should exclude those elements rather than take them. And then it, there's no reason it can't work when ix is a zero length vector. And uh, for that matter, it can now also work when ix is a vector of, of strings. Whereas, of course, the minus bit isn't going to work if ix is a vector of strings. Uh, so it expands the capabilities as well as fixing the bug when ix is, is zero length. And uh, we can also find more, we find more bugs if we say that negative numbers in ix are illegal. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you meant to exclude some things, but by mistake ix has some ne negative numbers, now you've got positive numbers instead, and well, the bug may be a bit hard to find. So, I think that's it for the part of these language extensions uh, addressed to these, uh, this sort of combined set of design flaws in R. And that's uh, uh, perhaps the most important part of this talk, because I think it would be good if uh, if uh, all our implementations implemented these things and, and one tried to move our users towards using these facilities and no longer uh, uh, have buggy code from using the colon operator. Uh, maybe I should ask for some discussion at this point, uh, at this point before going on. Uh, what do people think? Uh, yeah, there are so many rules of what happens in a subset. You mean currently or? Currently, yeah. I mean, these, these are two, I think, really big, big issues that, that do lead to buggy code because it's like, I mean, it, it gets really Byzantian. I mean, if, if, I mean, if it's a matrix, it's a one dimensional array, like you use one subscript, then uh, everything changes if uh, the, the value is a one dimensional array, right? Yeah, there are different forms of subscripting, like, um, I haven't talked about logical subscripts, and plus you can subscript with a matrix, which does something entirely different. But um, I'm not sure why that should get in the way of solving no, this. No, I agree with you. I'm absolutely agree with you. I, I, think, I think these are two, two really big issues. I'm just saying, I don't, I think the, the subscript operators have so much power, but also um, so many traps, right, uh, for users and, and implementers. So I, I don't, there is a lot of code. I mean, we can't change the semantics because, I mean, even implementing that operator, like starting out with a basic kind of intuitive implementation, uh, I mean, it just doesn't work, right? Because there's so many packages that fail because they expect, you know, the one dimensional array to retain its attribute, but the uh, vector or matrix will lose its attributes if you only use one subscript, mm -hmm. right? Uh -huh. Yeah, I've encountered a few of those. Um, there's some really peculiar things with um, when you do things, I forget, uh, I think if you look through the PQR news file, you'll see some comments about some particular things here, right? <laughs> where, where uh, oh yeah, I remember what it is, uh, where you say uh, M open square bracket, close square bracket with nothing in the middle. Uh, maybe, I, 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 it's bizarre, uh, that's, I, I, I probably shouldn't spend time on that. <laughs> Ah, well, PQR has a completely rewritten parser, uh, partly because uh, it's, uh, I think it's easier to add language extensions after you've rewritten the parser, partly because uh, it solves other problems with the parser. Well, uh, 
it's faster for one thing, right? But uh, 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 so I'm not sure how much. Like, there's no particular reason other people can't take PQRS parser if they want to. Um, I'm not sure how much work it would be to add this to the existing R core parser without rewriting it. There's some tricky things to do with um, uh, managing to parse the dot dot as a dot dot operator, even though dot dots sometimes are parts of identifiers, and so you have to look at the context to tell to disambiguate what's going on. This isn't a and this is a localized issue though. This isn't something with wide ramifications in itself. Uh, uh, could it be possible to parse the dot dot? Sorry, I, I couldn't hear that. No. Um, I'm assuming that one is stuck with the present behavior of the present constructs, except, well, the only thing I'm assuming is that it's okay to change the behavior of subscripting by a vector that has a dim attribute, a one-dimensional dim attribute, which I think is pretty rare at present, and so I'm willing to think that you can change the behavior there, but I'm assuming that you can't change the behavior of the colon operator, you can't change the present behavior of dimension dropping, when it's done with the, in the present way, that there'd be too many incompatibilities from doing that. Um, I don't know, maybe other people think that you can convince everybody to change their code. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, uh, PQR also now has some new forms of the for statement. Uh, these are a little bit uh, non-profound in that this, it's not like uh, the world ends if you don't have these extra features, uh, but it seems to me you can add them in easily, and they're a convenience. So, uh, for instance, you can say for i along v, it's uh, the same as saying for i and seek along v, and you can say for i j along m, where m is the matrix, and that uh, is a nested loop over the uh, columns and rows. And you can say for i down m to loop over the rows and j across m to loop over the columns. Um, there's no compatibility issues here because none of these ha things have to be reserved words. And for that matter, in, which is presently a reserved word, doesn't actually need to be a reserved word. Uh, there's no ambiguity and these all occur in a context where they have to be of that sort. Uh, there's no need to make them reserved words. So this doesn't break any uh, previous code to, to put those things in. And um, maybe they're sufficiently useful conveniences that it's worthwhile. Um, so uh, not implemented yet, but things I plan to do are some more things that you could see as sort of just syntactic sugar, but um, I think it is good to try to get rid of ugliness in code. And uh, some of these things are actually more than syntactic sugar because they allow you to write more flexible programs. So for instance, uh, um, I think it would be good to make x dollar fred be equivalent to x uh, uh, and then comma fred here in order to extract a, a named column of a matrix. So if your matrix has column names, uh, you can get a particular column by uh, x dollar fred. And that uh, is not only a convenience in that this is more concise than that, but it also means that if you have lots of code which uses this syntax to access columns of data frames, you can now, if your data frame happens to have only numbers in it, you can just convert it to a matrix and then run the same code. And uh, as, you, as you may realize, uh, converting data frame, numerical data frames to matrices uh, can in some circumstances make your code go uh, 20 times faster or something like that. So uh, it'd be nice if you could do that without having to change all your X dollar Fred references to be of this sort, uh, which do also work for data frames. So you, if, you, if you knew you wanted to do this, you might have written all your code this way, but it's more verbose than this. And you probably didn't do that if you weren't thinking of this idea originally, but now uh, uh, it'd be nice having written all your code this way to be able to just convert your data to a, to a matrix rather than a data frame and away you go. Uh, going much faster. Um, of course, this would work for assignment too. You could assign to the whole column by uh, assigning to x dollar fred. 
Um, it'd also be nice to have non-ugly attribute references. So uh, uh, the add operator already exists and is applied to S4 objects to get at the values, uh, get and set the values of slots, which are actually implemented as attributes. And so the proposal is to just make that work even if it's not an S4 object, so that x at Fred is the same as adder x Fred, and x at Fred becomes v is the same as the assignment form. Uh, it'd be nice to have more convenient ways to create lists. So um, a double dollar operator as a binary operator could take a list as its uh, uh, left op op operand and then uh, something to add to the list as its right operand, which could uh, be a named thing. So L dollar dollar A equals one, dollar dollar B equals two would be equivalent to uh, C, L, and list A equals one, B equals two. Now as a unitary operator, dollar dollar would create a one element list. And uh, furthermore, as illustrated here, um, both these dollar dollar operators, if, if the uh, right operand was a single name, would not only take that as a variable that gives the value of that list element, but also take it as the name of the list element. So this would be equivalent to list A, B equals A, B, C, D equals C, D, E, F equals E, F which is the sort of thing that I end up writing all the time when I uh, have a function that sets several variables to various results, and now I want to return them all in a list with names that are equal, of course, to the names of my variables. It would be perverse to give it a different name as a variable in my function than I'm going to give it as the name in the list. So I end up writing this as the results of functions all the time, and it would be nice to have, be able to write it more succinctly like this. Uh, it in fact used to be possible to just re write return and, and uh, return A, B, C, D, E, F and it would au automatically return that, but somebody decided to remove that feature a few years ago. Um, and a somewhat similar way to the double dollar operator here would be a more convenient way to add attributes. So if you did one dot dot six, add at dim equals C23, add at class equals Fred, you'd get a, a two-dimensional array uh, that is the class attribute of Fred. Uh, this is basically a more succinct alternative to the current structure function, uh, which you could do the same thing in a much more verbose and ugly sort of way. And another idea um, that I'm still debating whether it's really a good idea or a bad idea, uh, would be to have vector array constructors that are sort of along the lines of uh, some Python syntax. So we could say that v becomes square bracket 7 comma 1 comma 9, and that would be the same as saying v is c719. Um, uh, but it would have a 1d dim attribute of 3, so that it would uh, actually work properly for uh, array subscripting. And uh, uh, one could similarly do things that would uh, create matrices and such in a much more uh, syntactically clean way, I think, than one you would have, have to do it at the moment. And uh, it'd also be nice if uh, one could add a whole bunch of uh, 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 syntax or, or, or a single syntactic idea to let you add, attach flags to arguments, uh, both formal arguments and uh, actual arguments. So here's an example of how this would use, be used to uh, enable or su suppress lazy evaluation. The latest versions of R, I think, have a, sort of a hacky function to try to suppress lazy evaluation. Uh, but it would be uh, better if you could do it in a more uh, uh, nice way. So here's the definition of a function uh, that has two arguments, top and bottom. And the second argument is flagged as being not lazy. Of course, the first one is as present by default lazy. Uh, everything's by default lazy at the moment, but here we say it's not lazy. And then if we call f of uh, g and h, uh, h is evaluated immediately because it's not lazy. g will only be evaluated when someplace in the function f it gets referred to. Uh, but we could override that for this first argument by putting a not lazy flag in the on the actual argument. And similarly, we could override the not lazy part by putting a lazy flag on the actual argument. Um, so other things you could do here for flags are, are control whether or not exact uh, uh, argument name matching is required, and uh, make it so that you could uh, um, 
uh, say that an actual argument is ignorable, that it, it's not an error if there's no corresponding formal argument that's useful when you write functions that take other functions as arguments, for instance. And uh, you could also do something regarding whether uh, the argument is quoted, which switches by default to when you refer to the argument, you get the expression rather than the value of that expression. So here would be an example of this. You say show mean is a function that takes an x that's a quoted argument, and then you can say the mean of x is mean and then at x to actually get the value of x. And this would uh, give the this would evaluate to the expression that was passed, whereas this would uh, would actually get the value. And you could use this uh, to uh, uh, also sort of pass things effectively by reference or really uh, by LML60 call by name. Uh, and uh, if you extended this on to an uh, assignment, then you could uh, do things like have a, have a function that modifies its argument. So if we call zero corners with a matrix A here, it will change the matrix A in the caller by uh, these assignments to zero of the corners of the matrix. So uh, to uh, play around with this, I, I wrote a quoted args package that is on CRAN at the moment that implements this except for the assignment part, which isn't possible with current implementations of subset assignment. Um, and uh, it'd also be nice if you could uh, have flags that let you check uh, argument validity. Uh, these, so you could, uh, for instance, say that a function takes a scalar integer with no in, no in, that is not allowed to be an NA. And uh, this could be done very fast, and so it would be uh, uh, much more attractive to put in these annotations than if, uh, if there's a whole bunch of overhead in that. So um, it'd also be nice to have automatic differentiation, and uh, um, it'd be nice to do a few other things here, which I think maybe I've run out of time on. <laughs> so thank you. Sorry, but the remark, the last two things apart from this one were about annotation in some way. Mm -hmm. And uh, last year's ESC, we started to have a working group, you, Jan Wittek and, and others. And this ESC, yesterday we had uh, someone telling us, giving us a proposal for annotation using, uh -huh. using a different syntax. I mean, the syn they said it was just one proposal, but it's the same idea. You can you can annotate type or annotate documentation, by the way. Or, uh, uh -huh. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's so. So that is really messy within our core. I mean, we have not made a decision, but mm -hmm. several of us have expressed the idea. Yes, annotation is something we should really, mm -hmm. we really want to work strongly mm -hmm. together. So yeah, well, it'd be interesting to look at uh, what that proposal is like. Yeah. Uh -huh. the proposal should be available, probably from the DSC or. Mm -hmm. should be available. But there's, a, there's a nice presentation about just that proposal, which is, a, which is also just a ground for discussion, but uh, mm -hmm. it's also an implementation in a package. 